It is just a huge, huge, unbelievable honor today to be podcast interviewing Lincoln Harris. Man, dude, you have 13,000 posts, and you are so amazing. I remember when you came to the United States. You're, you're in Australia. It's uh, 3 in the afternoon here, and it's, what, 8 a.m. where you're at in uh, Queensland? Look, we moved a patient to squeeze you in. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you have to – did you do that? You started late today? We had – we heard there was this dude from Arizona. He had a toothache, and he wanted it pulled out as cheap as possible. <laughs> he via Skype. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're so that's so... the cheapest way to do it. You know, you're outsourcing it. It's tourism industry. By by the way, I you have thirteen thousand posts on downtown. I, I I think I mean if if someone said to me who's the most unbelievable cosmetic restorative dentist on earth, I I would say you. I mean I mean I I would have said that in two thousand five, and now it's two thousand and sixteen. Oh, shucks, you say that to all the girls, you big uh, flirt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, Link, you are just uh, unbelievable, amazing. And uh, by the way, my brother just moved to Sydney, Australia from Kansas, and he's, he's I went down there to visit him, and I was going to go visit you, but it's you're you're kind of far from Sydney. How far was yeah. that in a car? Uh, too far, too far. <clears throat> you get would... jet lag. Look, I drove it. If you want to get jet lag a lot cheaper, what you do is you drive from Sydney to where I live at Bagara, in one stint without stopping and by the time you get here you've got jet lag and how, how, how long would that drive be uh, 16 hours 16 hours and you're about three hours towards the equator from uh, brisbane gold coast yeah four four, four. hours yeah the, the road's quite dull so i tend to fly so it's 45 minutes in so one of those things with fans on the front so, uh, so I, I'm wondering, you know, I, I always wonder when I'm talking to the elites of the elites. I mean, you, you're 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 an instructor, you're, you're a dentist for the elite dentists. I mean, when I, when I talk to dentists who lecture on the circuit, um, I ask them who who are their, you know, who who are they big fans of? Who are they learning from? They always talk about you. Um, how how did you get out of school? I mean, and you're still young. You're only 38 years old. How how did you get out of school and just go right to the top? Uh, well, that's actually a little bit of an accident. Uh, so about 2004, I think it was, I decided that dentistry, you know, dentistry wasn't exciting. It was back when I used to read self-help books, see? Now, I, I advise people not to read self-help books because they just make you feel insecure and, and, and you need to buy whatever the person writing the book is selling you. So, But anyway, I used to read a lot of them back then and I read all this stuff about, uh, you know, you had to have a business that you didn't work in. Of course, I think that's absolute nonsense now because even people who don't physically work in their business, they work in their business. There's very few where the owner of a business is just a shareholder and most of those businesses don't run as well. Okay, I mean, sure, you don't do all the stuff in dental town, but you keep your hands on the on the levers pretty tight, I'm sure. So um, anyway, I decided I needed to have some sort of business that uh, wasn't just me drilling teeth. So. I decided I'd run conferences. It was a terrific idea. It was, in hindsight, it was a stupid idea, but at the time I thought it was amazing. And uh, people were just going to flock to these conferences. And uh, so I set up this conference at Whistler, because who wouldn't want to go there? Turns in, out a lot of people. In Canada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my wife's Canadian. I thought, oh, this would be a good gig. I'll get other people and we'll be able to go overseas and all have a nice time together. So I did this uh, conference and I budgeted on 100 people turning up and uh, spent up big on marketing and I got 15. So I managed to lose $100,000 on the first one. Anyway, while I was there, uh, some guy, was a guy, an endodontist from Vancouver, he said, mate, you should, you should go on this website called Dental Town. It's got a fairly big following. And... So around about, I think my first post on Dentaltown was about 2005, which was about the year I ran the first Whistler thing. So those two went together. So initially, I'd like to give you some sort of philosophical reason why I started learning a lot of stuff that's got a really good sort of moral to it, but I just wanted to sell my courses. <laughs> so I went on Dentaltown and I just wanted to sell my courses. Um, the business model was, you told me straight up that the business model was all wrong, okay? And uh, I decided I knew a lot more than you, so I completely ignored that. And uh, sometimes it takes a while to come around, 
um, I had to lose money for another four years before I come around. So I'm stubborn. Stupid and stuff started. No, you are wickedly smart. And we have something in common. A lot of people say, well, how did, how did you start Dental Town Magazine? My, my first magazine went out, um, lost 90000 the first month. Second month, lost eighty. I mean, I, I lost 90 a month. So that's, that's a good trend. That's oh, a good trend. my God. It was 90 then 80 then 7 I mean, it didn't. I didn't hit rock bottom till it was $1.8 million under. And people just like, yeah. like, oh, well, you got lucky. You started a magazine. You got lucky. And it's like, wow. Okay. But I did learn something. You went to Whistler because your wife was Canadian. Uh, Canadian, And uh, yeah. I want to give courses in Jamaica, so I need to marry me a Jamaican. Okay. So I, that's my to-do list today. Find All me right. a Jamaican that's Jamaican me crazy. Um, mm. So, uh, but um, see, there's a whole lot of comments that come to mind now, and they'll all be regrettable, and they'll they'll hit the editing suite. Like your son will be. To go, there's only five minutes left, Howard. You know? <laughs> uh, have you have you been to Jamaica? No, no. Oh I, my I god, think. that is that is the coolest area in the world. So, so tell us about. So, what what are you doing now? What what what's got you excited now? Look, I'm still excited about. Dinner. Actually, I'm probably more excited about dentistry than. Ever. And I, I know that's going to annoy a whole lot of people because a whole lot of people are all bitter and cynical and, you know, too bad for you. Uh, <laughs> I still like the stuff. Um, what's got me excited at the moment is I had a little accident a few years ago and in the, in the States, dentistry has been very competitive for a long time. You know, Australia is now very competitive, but back then it was very competitive, you know, 10 20 years. If you say to me, look, Australia's 20 years behind, I, I won't take offence, I'll just nod, okay? Uh, and so American-style marketing is, to some extent, a necessity. You have to do it just to get by. Uh, and anyway, I had this small town with a kind of slight shortage of dentists at the time, and no one was doing any marketing at all. It was like taboo. So I went on TV and I started spending seventy, hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year on marketing, and you can just imagine what that did. That just, like, the market share of the advertising space, I had a hundred percent, and so I just had patient after patient after patient who all wanted complex dentistry, and I'd learned a fair bit on Dental Town and all the courses I'd been to in the states, and. Uh, when you do consultations day after day, like you're doing 50 new patient consultations all about complex work in a month, you start to realise that some of the stuff they teach at courses is a little bit inflexible. So you go to a course, uh, you go to a course on you know worn dentition, and it says, okay, you take study models and every single person, and you mount them, and you you do a protrusive record and a CR record and all this sort of nonsense, okay? And that is true. You should do that on some cases, but you don't want to do that on every single... You don't want to inflict that on every single patient that comes through the door because you still need your toothache. I'm a general dentist. I still need... I had a patient yesterday come in. She's got perio everywhere. She's got decay everywhere. She looks a mess. I pulled out one tooth, okay? And I don't mind doing that at all. That's, that's the real world. That solved her problem. So what's exciting me is I've de developed this treatment planning course. It's called RETP, Rapid Efficient Treatment Planning. It is basically how you take all this high-level stuff that you learn at courses like Warren Dentition, but mix it into a general practice where you have the whole range of patients. I mean, you have patients who need one tooth out. You have patients who want, you know, a, a partial denture because they can't afford anything else. But then... Occasionally, your big fish swims in, and you want to be able to land that one too. You know, you don't want to let him go. He wants to spend fifty thousand. He's got the money. He wants to do it right away. Don't let him get by. Do your full records on them, but don't do full records on a patient who wants a, a single tooth ripped out as cheap as possible, because you'll just annoy them. So that's that's what got me. Is basically just it's how to have a system without having a system. So now, are you teaching this course hands-on in Australia? In what what, what is it, Bagara, Bargara, Queensland, Australia, or is this an online course? Or are you traveling around uh, doing this in different countries? I'm I'm developing it for online, but that's as you probably know, doing stuff online is never it's a fair bit of work. So 
at this stage I only teach it. I've been teaching in Australia. Um, I've just launched a course. I'm doing it in Auckland and Singapore this year and also there you go, there's a doorbell donger. That's what mine sounds like. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Auckland, Singapore, and I just launched it for London. London I launched about three days ago. It's nearly sold out. Uh, that'll be for the end of the year. And I, a few people say they want me to come to the States. I'm still slightly anxious about the States because everything I ran in North America was a complete flop. So this is different because it's a course about information, not How long about is the course? tourism. It's How two days. You, you should do uh, the two-day course before the townie meeting in Vegas. We'll market it all up that come two days early or, or stay two days after. Or if you are um, – I'll co-put it on with you in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we've been doing uh, local courses at the uh, Talking Sticks Indian Casino right by Dentaltown. Mm -hmm. So there, there's thought if you want to do that. Well, you've got Gail's email. Send her an email and we'll make it happen. Ryan said – who? That's, is that your wife, Gail? No, 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 no. You, you've got you've got specific instructions about staff. No, she she is. Uh, <laughs> Send it to Gail at RestoringExcellence.com.au. I think it's. Oh, uh, look, I'll text it to you later because I can't remember what it is. Gail is the one who is. She's kind of my general manager because she runs a lot of the finances at the office and she overviews all my course stuff and my rental properties and. Stuff like that. So. Well, anything you sure. want, any anything you need, you want uh, help with for, from Dentaltown. I mean, it, it's uh, uh, it just be an honor to work here. So, so do you want you want to talk about your you're calling it RETP Rapid Efficient Treatment Planning? You want to talk about that? Oh, look, we can talk about it a bit, but you know, <clears throat> we could get a bit bored with that because I talk about it all the time. I've got to talk about it three times, seven times this year. So, <laughs> what have you been doing? You've been you've been Jogging up mountains and stuff. You weren't doing that 10 years ago. You know what? When I uh, I uh, turned 50, I was 238 pounds, and I realized, you know, my dad and both grandfathers died at 60 because because they, they were a bunch of uh, fat guys who never exercised. So I started doing the Ironman every year, and uh, and then every year I do an Ironman and I climb one of the tallest mountains. So I've done three Ironmans and I climbed the tallest in Africa, Kilimanjaro, in Australia. I cannot pronounce that name. It's a Polish name. Yeah, Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko. That's so hard for my walnut brain to remember. Yeah. And then and, I, and seven Polish people just died, but because I pronounced it with a with an Australian accent. Yeah. And <laughs> I forgot probably, the, probably, oh, oh oh. And then now now I want to do the third one. So the third easiest one I have to do is uh is uh, uh Russia, or some, somewhere out there. So I need I need to do that this year. But yeah. um, but yeah, See, I'll tell you what. One though. of the one of the problems with not being metric is. You know, 230 pounds sounds a lot worse than 107 kilos. <laughs> so, so, so when you're starting out, okay, first of all, just go metric. That's my advice to people losing weight, okay? Just cut it straight down to kilos, okay? The only problem is you've got to work twice as hard to lose each kilo thereafter. That's uh, that's my favorite joke. We could solve global warming if we just switched to Celsius. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all the right, we've, we've, we've offended two key stakeholders. Two key stakeholders so far, so I think we're, we've uh, we've done well. We've got, a, got I'll our way through the list. I'll tell you what. Uh, what is bumming me out though? What's what's bad is my brother uh, moved from uh, Kansas to Sydney, Australia. So I yeah. went down there and uh, took my uh, two boys, who uh, uh, well, the oldest one's married, another one has a girlfriend. He can't uh, leave her side, and uh, so I went down there with the two single bachelor boys, and I just yeah. sit there. I visited them a couple times, and I sit there the whole time saying. I, I can't leave it. I mean, how do you leave Sydney and go back to the suburbs, Phoenix? I mean, if I walk out my front yard in the suburb and lay down in the middle of the street, no one would even know it for three days. You go out my brother's front door, and it's just restaurant, bar, bookstore, subway. I mean, living in Sydney, and every every time we come back, I just walk around Phoenix thinking, why the hell do I live here? I mean, that has got to be the coolest city in the world. Well, it's because it's your home, boy. You know, I go lots of places and they're amazing. I went to, last year I went to to Dallas to see Pat Allen because if there's ever, you know, one of the greatest gentlemen in dentistry is Pat Allen and if, if you don't do soft tissue grafting, I mean, I teach soft tissue grafting so I shouldn't promote someone who's got a competing course but, you know, if anyone hasn't gone and seen Pat Allen, they should. You know, you, and, just and what city is he in? P-A-T-A-L-L-E-N? A L L E N Pat Allen. He does twenty twenty plastic surgery. He's probably one of the biggest people in soft tissue grafting. 
um, help That's develop, you know, if anyone's ever used an Elliderm graft, some of their technique comes from him. Wow. He's only just down the road from you, boy. You can drive. Yeah, Dallas, Texas. That is interesting. Uh, so, I hope so it's Dallas. It would be, be embarrassing if I got the wrong city. So I went over there, but, um, you know, and Dallas is, I'd never been to Texas before. And, you know, all these people up in the posh parts of Northeast America are going to get upset now, but it's a beautiful place. I really liked it. Although it did, uh, I strayed a few blocks off the main city centre and there was one bit that went downhill very quickly and I retreated from it. But uh, uh, the hospitality of Pat was just, well, his first name's actually, I think, Edward. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, one of those, he's one of those people who has a first name that he doesn't use, I think. Even on Facebook, pretty hip. And, uh, uh, yeah, so I do all these trips to amazing places like Dallas and, and this next two weeks' time I'm going to Poland and for a surgical course. But, you know, and their towns are much more amazing where I live. It's like you, it's my home. I like it when I come home. Yeah, I, and I, I love traveling. I'm taking two of my boys next week. I'm, I got three lectures on uh, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, Japan. I mean, I just, I just love doing that. I mean, just fly around. I mean, I love that. Um, so so let, let's talk about um, specifics. Uh, podcasting is big fans of the young. I mean, not a lot of old grandpas uh, know what a podcast is or ever done one. But you go into the dental schools, yeah. you, you, you meet dentists under 30, they all do it. And they're, um, they want to be great like you someday in treatment planning and aesthetic dentistry. What, what advice would you give them? What, what's some low-hanging, well, you know, what, what's, what's some advice? Well, first of all, I wouldn't recommend that everyone... One of the most important lectures that I ever went to from a technical point of view was one back in the, I think it was the Pacific Dental Forum in Vancouver. And the guy speaking was Jeff Morley, who was one of the founders of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. I didn't even know what the AACD was, and I had never heard Jeff before. And there was two things I remember. One, he's a really funny speaker. Uh, and just the, the type of work, I had never seen anything like it. And I was inspired. So, but it took me a long time to learn that I'm not Jeff Morley. So no matter how hard I try, I'm actually a different person. And then I went, listened to some other guru and I tried to be them for a while and then I tried to be someone else. So at some point, you have to learn that you can't be the person teaching you because they are a different person. They have so many differences in their life where they live, their upbringing, their values, everything is different. I can't be you and you can't be me. So even if I go to your lecture and I like some of the stuff you say, I can't be a little Howard, okay? Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't recommend anyone try and do exactly what I do. They need to first figure out what, who they are. What, you know, some people don't enjoy what I do. Uh, what I do is not, it's certainly not the most profitable type of dentistry. Uh, by long shots. So it's profitable enough for me, but it's not the most profitable. So it's not suitable for everyone. So I, I would recommend don't try and be a guru of any sort because it'll just make you unhappy. If you want to do really fine work, the things that I'd probably recommend is one, do a lot of CE. Uh, and I used to say that before I did CE, so it wasn't a conflict of interest back then. And the other one is and it is not to try and earn too much money in your first year or two. Now that's more difficult, obviously, if you graduate with huge debts, but I earn very little for four or five years because you can get people to pay more for something once you have a reputation, but it's difficult to get them to pay more for something until you have a reputation. So in some extent, you have to do work that is worth more than what you're paying, what you're charging, until the point comes that you can charge enough for it. And that's it's actually still true for me now. So quite often when I introduce a new procedure, I will do it for free several times. I will often undercharge for it for a little while until I get enough repetitions under my belt. And then, you know, only recently if I started charging enough for soft tissue grafting to really make it worthwhile. So uh, I learnt soft tissue grafting off the internet by looking at uh, 
um, Danny Malchus cases on Dentaltown. There was no one in Australia that I knew of that taught it. And I graduated from dental school without actually knowing that a soft tissue graft could be done. Now, Danny Melkers, he's in, down in Florida, and he, in Clearwater, yeah. Tampa City. Yeah. And did, didn't he just retire? Uh, he may well have done, but I don't know. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think uh, I was talking to a dentist down there, and said he just retired. Yeah. But what do you have? YouTube it? videos, or is this on his website? Yeah, it... no, he had a um, he had a, just a DVD disc. He actually sent me the disc. Well, I just saw the cases. Now people learn in different ways. I learn by seeing, I can watch something get done and then go, oh yeah, I see how that's done and then I can do it, okay? Um, I can't learn how to do something by reading words, but other people are different. So we all learn in different ways and that's just me and it's neither good nor bad, it just is. Uh, so I saw his cases hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, just the photos on Dental Tank, okay? He's taken a piece of tissue off the palate and he's done this and he sutured it in like that and so after a while I thought well I've got this case and the tissue is terrible I'm going to cut a piece of pallet off and suture it in just like he's done and lo and behold it worked and then I did it so I've been doing soft tissue grafting for since my first one which I've still got photos of is 2007 so we're just coming up to nine years now uh, I have done I have started doing more formal courses on it in more recent times. Actually, interestingly, because I knew nothing about what I was supposed to do, <laughs> I did develop this technique because I did something that you're not actually allowed to do, which is when you're doing a free gingival graft on an implant, it's very difficult to get them to work because there's no blood supply and there's no decent attachment to the implant in the healing phase. And so uh, because I didn't know that you weren't supposed to pull the flap back over the top of a free gingival graft, that's what I've always done when I did grafting over implants, and I think it actually works better. Ziv Simon, uh, that guru in uh, Southern uh, Cal, where is he? You, yeah, Beverly Southern Hills, Cal. Sir. Yeah, he he sent me this message. He said, "Hey, you're not meant to do that." And then two weeks later, I sent him the healing photo. He says, "Wow, that's really good." He said, "You should publish that. That's a new technique." <laughs> Are you gonna? Uh, he keeps pushing me too, but. So, so writing, writing articles is it's hard work. You got to so look up references Lincoln, and stuff. Lincoln, um, these young kids are overwhelmed because you know dental school. You know everybody complains of what they didn't learn in dental school, but they, they got to take a kid off the street and then four yeah. years later give them a license to do anything they want. So the, the, I, when I go into dental schools, I mean they're they're overwhelmed. You know, you, so but they're coming out of school and they're mesmerized by should I learn? You know. Tissue grafting, sinus lifting, bone grafting, implants, sleep medicine, um, Invisalign, short-term ortho. Give give some uh, give some tips to these young kids because you're probably talking to several thousand dentists under 30. Um, you know they can't take every online CE course. They they can't be a sleep medicine and an orthodontist and an implantologist and do bone grafting. What 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 advice would you give on where to start? Okay, if you have a particular area of interest, follow it. That would be my first thing. Okay, there are things I don't do. I hate molar endo, so I I try not to do it. I refer it to an endodontist. Is it the smell that you don't like? Uh, it's just, uh, I just don't like trying to get a 0 0.06 file down. I just get frustrated. You know, I want to get stuff done, bang, bang, bang. It. And it's probably... It's not stressful enough, probably. <laughs> I get it. Uh, it's too predictable for you. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's just, it's you know, like when you're cutting a piece of bone off and sticking somewhere else, that, that's a lot of stress, and you know, you don't get bored. Uh, so do things you enjoy. If you find that you really enjoy a particular thing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can pursue that, okay? And if you do it well enough and for long enough, then you'll do more of it. That's just how it is. Uh, if you just want to know in general, I would say learn how to do restorative dentistry, so how to plan your fillings and your crown and bridge work first, because that drives everything else. Okay, I see so many people where they go and learn how to do uh, implant surgery. They have absolutely no idea about general restorative treatment planning. And they're a general dentist, so they actually have to do the restorative as well. So learning to do bone grafting and to do implants and all that before you know how to do decent treatment planning on, and I don't even teach, I don't teach 
you know, the fine details of restorative treatment. I, I do run a course in my office, but it's only for Australian dentists. It's a live patient course. So, and I only do three people a year. That's, that's a whole different thing. But that learn to do your general, I guess, if you want to be blunt, prosthodontic treatment planning first. Then plug in all the other stuff that allows you to do it. So until you know, okay, we need to get the soft tissues here, we need to get the bone there, we need implants there, and we need to do ortho to change all this so that I can put crowns on or veneers and it'll look nice. I think learning to do all the other stuff is, you know, learn to design the house first and then learn to do the plumbing and the electrical work later. So are you placing implants? Of course I have. I've been placing implants for... 2000 and but I mean, is that one of the things you're doing now, now though? Is that something you like now? Yeah, yeah, I place implants. So, I place, so things that I like doing in my office, okay, my number one thing is basically solving a patient's problem. That is, that is why I'm a dentist. The patient has a goal and I say, this is where you are here. That's where you are now. That's where you want to be. How do we get from there to there in a budget you can afford? Which is the most difficult part of dentistry. It's the actual you know, bit where you have to think. Drilling holes in bone is not, you know, it's just woodwork. So, uh, so the, the stuff that I like doing, I like doing bone grafting, soft tissue grafting, implants, uh, rehabilitating, composite. So really I like, you would say, perio-pros stuff. You like blood and guts. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind ortho as long as it's ortho just so I can do my restorative. I don't like doing kids. I... I used to think I wanted to do kids because I just, you know, everyone else was treating kids and I thought, well, B, I, I better do kids too just to be like all the cool cool dentists. But um, I don't really like treating kids. Uh, you know, they're unpredictable and they cry and, you know, and they're little teenagers with braces that are a pain in the bum. And, and it reminds me of college <laughs> when your uh, five uh, homies got uh, drunk at a bar, you know, you, you, you give a kid a sedation or whatever, and one, it's perfect, one gets sleepy, one gets crazy, one goes nuts, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. you, you I mean, every time students I... get drunk at a bar, one gets mad, one gets happy, one, it's just random chaos. Yeah, yeah, certainly treating kids reminds me of your college days. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so then back, back to the advice, so, so it's this young kid, they got out of school, they never placed an implant. Where, where where would you recommend they, they go? Would you recommend that they uh, pick a uh, oh, look, type? People ask, me, people ask me all the time, which courses should I do? I don't know, just start doing one. Just do one. You know, people agonize for days and days and days. I mean, if you look at my, if you look at the list of courses I've done, it is such a hodgepodge of things. If they want to actually learn really quickly, what they should do is take photos of their work and stick it online somewhere. Obviously, get your consent from your patient first, so it's not illegal, but... Um, uh, but, you know, put your photo up for someone else to look at. It's a little bit like the, what is it, the Heidenberg uncertainty principle. You cannot photograph dentistry and see how it was when it wasn't photographed because the process of photographing your dentistry changes it. If you take a photograph of your dentistry, I can guarantee that your prep will be better. And if you show it to 10,000 other dentists, I can guarantee it'll be a lot better, okay? It's impossible. If you know that you're going to photograph the case and put it up, your work just gets better. So just photograph it all the time. There you go. There's tip one. Take photos. Actually, the most important thing that photography teaches you, it actually teaches you to see. As people, we have tunnel vision, okay? Like right now, I mean, when you do Skype, there's two things. I can either look down here at your face, but then it looks like I'm looking down the whole time, or I can look up here at the camera, so it looks like I'm looking straight at you. So... You know, I, I switch between the two. But when I'm looking at that, the, the amount of area I'm looking at is about that big. It's not very big. All this out here, I'm completely ignoring because that's how our eyes work. And so when we do dentistry, where they're saying we look at this tiny part of the tooth and we completely ignore everything else that's going on. And when we take a photo, it captures everything else that's going on and it forces us to confront it. It's like when you go to a wedding and you take a picture of the bride and groom when they're taking it, having their kiss, and you go, wow, that's going to be an amazing photo. And because of the angle you're on, you realize you've got a massive palm tree growing straight out of the top of the bride's <laughs> head. Okay? And you never notice because you had tunnel vision. So that happens with your dentistry too. So I actually have no idea what point we are originally trying to make. But anyway, take photos of stuff. Well, it, it's you true. You, you'll, you'll just become a better dentist with any kind of magnification, whether you're wearing lubes or if you microscope for uh, endo, any form of magnification. I, I thought the 
most the, the best thing about buying a Ciroc machine is the first time I scanned the prep and I saw my prep 40x bigger, and you're just like, oh my god. Is that the best thing or the worst thing about a Ciroc machine? I, I haven't decided yet. Do, do you use, <laughs> use a Ciroc machine? Okay, I had a Ciroc machine for a long time, and then it fell by the wayside because I started doing too many multi-unit cases, and it got the software at the time was too difficult. And at that time, the machine I had, I think, was a bit of a lemon. It used to break down all the time. And because I'm so far away, I'm four hours from Brisbane by car and 15, 16 hours from Sydney or two and a half hours of flying time and transit. You know, if your machine breaks down and you, you've already prepped the tooth and you didn't take a pre-op impression, it's a, you know, it's a bit of a pest. How, how far um, are you from the Great Barrier Reef? Uh, 30 miles. Man, that's amazing. I've never made it down to Darwin. That's... Uh... I want to go see visit you someday and then go all the way to Darwin. Mm -hmm. ne ne yeah. Next time I'm with my brother, I want to do that. Right, that'll be. Mm. Anyway, but Ceric uh, software is much better now, so I'm, uh, it's tickling me. I'm, so, I'm falling into temptation again. I so keep the, seeing the cases. They're getting better. <laughs> so... Um, Back, um, so, so back when you're talking about treatment planning and you're talking about, you know, first you need to learn how to do the fillings, the crown and bridge and all that, and you can go back later and learn the plumbing and electrical, but get to build a house. Um, so, so one early question these guys got to uh, um, decide. So they're, they're young, they're out of school, they, they want to go learn occlusion, and there's two distinct camps. There's the, the neuromuscular uh, group, there's the, the Pinky Dawson uh, group. Any, any thoughts there? I've done both. 90% of everything they both teach is exactly the same, okay? And here, I'm going to summarize occlusion for you in two minutes because the rest nice. of it is all fine level fine level stuff, which everyone argues. First of all, there's, there's no significant outcome-based proof on a lot of this stuff. Um, I've seen, you know, a lot of your studies are just anecdotal, okay? But here is occlusion in a nutshell. One, have all your teeth hit at the same time. So that's rule number one. Rule number two, uh, make sure when they grind about from side to side that you don't have any delicate bits of porcelain because porcelain is very brittle when you put it under tension and it breaks. So if you have any delicate incisal edges, they'll break off. And three, stick a piece of plastic of any sort of design that you like between the teeth after you've fin finished so that they, when they grind at night time, they don't break stuff. That's it. And see, I can't do an institute on this. It's so too simple. Have all your teeth hit at the same time. Don't have and since this is dentistry, and since this is <laughs> dentistry, and, <laughs> and since this is dentistry uncensored, what percent of the stuff do you hear from the occlusion experts? Do you think is just voodoo or unproven or their opinion versus just okay. science um, facts? How about we just move to dentistry in general? Okay, I would say that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> anything that dentists argue about passionately is probably unproven, and that's why they're arguing about it, okay? No one argues about the fact that if you have a tooth that has no bone anywhere near, near it, and the patient's lower jaw is swelling up and going to close their airway, that they need to have that extracted, okay? We don't argue about that because we just all know it's true. Okay, and now that I've said that, there's going to someone write you a message telling us that that's actually not true <laughs> and arguing about it. Now, things that we argue about all the time are things often where it probably doesn't make that much difference which way you do it. What actually matters more than which thing you do is how well you do it. Okay, I have, I have neuromuscular cases from... Nine years ago, full mouth rehabs that are going well. Now, I don't do anything neuromuscular now, and the reason why is because I don't want to have to use $50,000 machinery to take a bite. I want to use a piece of plastic that costs two cents, okay? So, because it's cheaper to do, it's just a lot cheaper for me to do CR. And the other thing is that CR type dentistry for me is much more flexible. I can use it in really cheap cases where I'm only doing a couple of teeth. Um, I can use it in big complex cases. I don't have to do an all or nothing type approach. So 
Uh, most of my stuff now is really verging either on MIP or CR dentistry just because it's more flexible, it's cheaper, it's quicker, and I get the same sorts of results either way. But I have got a lot of rehabs that were done with neuromuscle, and they, they're going just fine because all the teeth hit at the same time. Um, neuromuscular teaches people to do nice rounded cusps, not pointy, delicate ones that break off, and I still give them all a bite guard anyway. So what, what would you call the other one other than neuromuscular? Would you just call it CR occlusion or MIP? Uh, what, what, what would be the uh, catch-all easiest? Let, let's, let's see how many people we can get arguing over this. You know, I think we, we, should, we should come up with a definition of centric relation during this because it's about 75. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's always um, changing. Centric relation is a position where the mandible is somewhere near the, the skull uh, place. I th I think I love what you said, Dennis. Uh, don't argue about things that are. You said Dennis only argue about things that don't matter or can't be proved. And I've always uh, I used to have a joke with uh, my uh, friends that uh, would you see why do Dennis get on dental town and argue till three o'clock in the morning because the stakes are so low. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that there's a fair bit of there is some evidence that the there's a lot of evidence, okay, that the quality of the surgeon matters a lot more than the type of procedure chosen. If you do, like people argue all the time about, you know, should you do a cast post and core or a fibre post or a preformed solid metal post or all this sort of nonsense, okay? <clears throat> Whatever way you do it, if you do one of those types of posts and you don't drill out the side of the root and perforate it, it will be a lot better than if you do. Okay? And if you do one with a beautiful impression or a beautiful scan where you had beautiful retraction and when you go to cement and bond that crown in, you make absolutely sure there's no biofilm or plaque or gunk or temporary cement on the, on the prep and you don't have any fluid and so you've got a proper bonding or cementing, I don't care what cement you use it'll still be better than if you use the world's best cement and you've got plaque on your prep. So often we argue about which procedure, which, uh, which way you do it, and there's about a hundred different ways that you can, I used to say there's a hundred ways you could, you know, a hundred ways you could skin a cat, but one of my vegan friends complains every time I say that. So, you know, there, there's a hundred ways you can put a post in a tooth. So. Doing a good job is better than which type of post you choose. So do a good job is my advice. What about what would you say the same about implants? It doesn't matter what type of implant. I mean, there were 275 implant companies at Cologne last year. How is a young townie listening to you right now, trying to buy their first system? How, what advice would you give them on picking between 275 different implant systems? Uh, whoever you like as a teacher, because you get on well with them emotionally and personally and you like how they teach and they have a teaching style that you absorb their information well and who shows you their failures. If they don't show you a single failure in their entire lecture, their lecture is horse poo, okay? Because every dentist who places implants gets failures. If they don't have a failure, they are lying. So if I go to a lecture and I see these amazing cases where they do things that look a little bit too miraculous like you know, we pulled the front tooth out, we placed the implant, we had a crown on it in five minutes. And here's the gum tissue. Look how amazing it is. And all my, I never have a failure. Okay, I, that's my first advice, is if, if the person teaching you implants doesn't spend a bit of time talking about all the stuff ups they've made and all the things that went wrong, even though they did it perfectly, I would discount their knowledge by at least 20%. The other thing is that beware of the word survival rate. Survival rate is the biggest nonsense that's ever been inflicted on implant dentistry and I am still cranky about it because it led me astray for a long time. An implant that has lost 85% of its bone and has pus coming out is surviving, but it is not successful and the patient will still be unhappy. You need to look at complication rates and the complication rates when you dig into the literature and ignore, when you look at implant literature, okay, this is what, here's some tips on reading implant literature. Ignore the abstract. The abstract is lying 
99% of the time. Okay, It is a marketing piece designed to get you to read the rest of the article or at least buy it. Or even more importantly, if you're doing a lecture, you read the, the abstract and then you can put a little thing that says, you know, Jefferson 2006 said such and such and you sum an entire complex research article down into one line and ha it just happens to support what you said in your lecture. So ignore abstracts. Generally ignore the conclusion because half the time the conclusion is nonsense as well and go straight to materials and methods. Okay, And what you find, and then you have to get your calculator out and actually calculate the stats for yourself because often they won't add up the stats that are really important. Like all the implant crowns that broke and the screws that came loose and the ones that lost bone and all that, they don't, don't compile those statistics because they fall under a bunch of things called complications. And when I look at the literature and add this up myself, I find that the complication rate of implant dentistry done by really good, well-known implant dentists reaches up to 20% in two to three years. Now, why is that important? Because I consider a complication something that costs me or the patient money. And so for me, that's a big deal. Okay, now the implants are surviving. We're getting 98% survival rates or 96 or whatever nonsense you want to believe. But the actual complication rate of implants. So I'll tell you something. I sometimes cut perfectly good enamel off teeth and do bridges because I can't. How often do you do a bridge that gives you a problem? Almost, most never. So all those times that I sat there and said to the patient, you know what, we do a bridge, we've got to cut this tooth, and we've got to cut that tooth, and your poor little teeth, they're going to cry, and they're weak tears of <laughs> sorrow, and, you know, they've lost their enamel, because every time we, you know, every time you remove an enamel rod from a tooth, a baby seal dies. <laughs> okay, so just think, when you're prepping teeth, you're killing seals. Okay, the little, the little fluffy ones that are cute. So... Quite often now, I sit there and go, well, the complication rate on bridges, unless you're a complete hack and you can't resist prepping into the pulp because you're just hopeless, and if you're that bad, then you shouldn't be doing implants either. The complication rate on bridges is very, very low. And the complication rate on implants and the cost to fix one that goes belly up takes out the profit of the next four or five. So look at complication rates. Complication rates on a lot of immediate load cases are definitely in the range of 20%, 15 to 20% at two years. So these full arch cases that are done with hybrid acrylics that are fixed on, you know, four or six implants, complication rates. And the, so the implant, the, the, the studies will say the implants are surviving. If you read the study, they don't talk, they talk about all the acrylic teeth that fractured off, the screws that come loose, the prosthesis that actually fractured through the framework, the implants that fractured um, and had to be redone and removed and bone grafted, um, all those things that are a pain in your practice. You know, oh no, Mrs. Jones is in again and her tooth's broken off and she's sheared off all the front teeth and blah, blah, blah. Look at the complication rates because those things add up to a, a lot. So there's my answer to uh, budding implantologists, do more bridges. Okay. Well, you know, it's true because, um, you know, for the last five years, you know, you get a really good looking woman missing a front tooth with a high lip line. You can just nail it with a three unit bridge. But you go in there and try to do a single root implant and all that stuff. You, you need a skill level of Beethoven or Mozart or Chopin. And, 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 and it's funny because if you ever heard my, my buddy who's at ENT talk about a dentist doesn't want to shave down the enamel. So he drills into my sinus and does all this shit and puts all this bovine bone and all that stuff. So oh. we're emotional about shaving down enamel, and we don't because the, ba the baby seals, the baby seals are dying. Yeah, and, and the kill e some seals, I say, kill some seals. And the e and my ENT buddy and rhinologist, they they think the same about the sinus. They don't they don't want you in their sinus. They're like, you shave down your enamel, and we're we're dentists, yeah. so we want to blow out their oh, sinus. Yeah, okay, here, here now you've got me on. You've got me on my high horse now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Minimal intervention. If there has ever been a word that I tire of in this de dental age, it's minimal intervention. I knew that the world had gone mad when people started advertising the minimal intervention lateral wall sinus lift. Was that Tatum and Hill? I, no, or I'm Hill not Tatum. going to so I'm not, this, this is common. You can flog anything if you put... If you want to sell something, you, look, 
the minimal intervention decapitation technique. <laughs> <laughs> the minimal intervention total leg amputation. <laughs> we use microsurgical techniques. Okay. <laughs> It is, you can flog anything. So here's my tip to you, Howard. Don't, don't let the rest in, okay? This is just between you and me, but put minimal intervention on the front of anything and you can sell it to dentists by the boatload, okay? So the minimal intervention, full clearance. Okay, there it is. See if you can make that happen. I reckon that's a lecture topic. The so minimal intervention, full clearance. Okay, here's another one. To avoid doing a little wall in the side of a sinus lift, what we're gonna do is wear and make you a bit swollen. We're going to extract all your teeth and cut off five millimetres of bone in an alveolectomy so that we can put some angled implants in so that we can be minimal interventionist. That's the all in four technique? Uh, it's not necessarily all in four, it's just, you know, where you, you see how mad it is? You're, you're cutting off all this bone to avoid doing a sinus lift because it's minimal intervention. I think that's rubbish, okay? Or I'm going to cut the side, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, Cut your gum and flap it up halfway to your eyeball, cut the bone off the side of your sinus and lift the membrane and stuff it full of cow so that they don't shave a bit of enamel off your two adjacent teeth because they want to be minimal interventionist. Now, I thought we only use bovine in cow country America. I thought you guys use kangaroo bone. I hadn't thought about that. My I God, you should do that. You say minim no, 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 minimally, minimally invent, mentally intervention kangaroo bone. Bovine is just too big and fat and intrusive. Right. You know how in America, like deer are like, there's millions of deer, okay, and they eat your lawn and they, people think of them as a, they're kind of cute, but they're a bit of a pest. Well, that's what kangaroos are in Australia, okay? They're, everywhere else in the world, they're like our national emblem and they're a fluffy toy that they sit, they take home from their trip to Australia. But here they're like deer. There's about, I don't know, 80 to 100 million of them and they're, eat your lawn and they hit the front of your car and put a hole in your radiator and they're you know we have quite a few uh, I, was, I was listening to a I don't, uh, think we can market, I don't think we can market kangaroo, kangaroo bone I think it's not going to fly I was listening to a debate yeah. about uh, whether or not you should uh, you know in Arizona let them uh, give licenses to kill deer and this guy was showing me a website that more deer are killed by hit by a car on Arizona highways that are uh, given permits to hunters to shoot I want to ask you another controversial thing that these young kids are always asking me they're hearing all these mixed signals on a cement or screw on an implant. You could literally find 100 threads, say, in each side. Well, you can definitely find 100 threads if they're exposed. Okay. No, no, I mean, I mean 100 threads on a metal town. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, I do screw that was your pun. That was a pun on the word thread. I do screw retain because they're easier most of the time. Uh, you know, cementing... Okay, people have cemented crowns on implants for a long time, but it is a much more difficult thing. So if let's let's give it the Ferran test. Which one is easier, simpler, and cheaper? Screw. Screw retained. Okay? It takes you less. So how much time does it take you to screw a crown onto a tooth? About 12 seconds. And then we stuff, we torque test it, and we take an x-ray. So there's about another 40 seconds. We put some Teflon tape in. So I'd say we're up to a minute and a half so far. And then we swizzle a little bit of metal primer and some bonding agent and put some composite and we're all done in 10 minutes or less. You know, I really we love cement, your, We I, do cement retained, okay? We put the abutment in. We know that cement going down the side of it will ruin our day. So then we get the crown and we inject the crown full of silicon. So we've got a, an internal mold of the crown and we put retraction cord down around the abutment and then we put a little bit of cement, just a tiny bit, inside the crown and we get our silicon mould that we made already and we stuff it in there to squeeze most of the cement out and wipe it off. And then we cement the crown. And that procedure takes at least twice as long. It's about five times more difficult. Sometimes you have to do it. So know how to do it, but try and avoid it because it's just a nuisance. It's difficult. And then, because occasionally you're so delicate with your cement, the crown gets loose three weeks later and you've got to cement it a second time. Okay, so complication rate on basically screw retained more profitable. Very good. There you go. So, so, you heard that. so what, what, what's the word we're going to cite on if it's not neuromuscular? Neuromuscular versus what would you just call it? CR or uh, what, what, what's what's the what's the simplest word for the other camp not neuromuscular? 
the camp that fights with neuromuscular. Yeah, what would that camp be called? The camp that um, fights with neuromuscular, the neuromus, the anti, the neuromusculars versus the anti neuromusculars. Yeah, like, here's the thing. Just I don't, I don't care which occlusion camp you're going to. Just go to one of them and then go to another one. Hey, uh, well, no, well, the point I was making is I really love your advice. I mean, the the main difference between neuromuscular one and uh, joints, and one of them is worried about muscles. Yeah, well, the, the main you difference. You want to know the though, difference? Okay, if you want to, if you want to realize you know nothing about bites, go to the American. What is it? The AES, American Equilibration Society meeting. I went to that last year. Okay, maybe don't go. This is my advice. Yeah. Don't go to the AES, okay? Because I went to it last year, and all I learned out of that is that I know nothing, okay? There was guys that had linked the, you know, the embryo, what the embryo was doing with later issues. And I think, oh, my God, There's a, what's that dude in Texas? I think he's in Texas. Rouse, someone Rouse. He's a genius. He's, I just, my brain shriveled up and ran away and hid for several days after listening to him. And I, I haven't got the internet open because it'll ruin my connection, but he's in, he's in, I think he's in Texas. Anyway, he's, he's a very smart dude. His lecture was amazing. But I mean, just listening to all those guys at AES, you had, you had they had everything from chiropractors, you know, they had everything from, from quacks to Quakers at that place. It's amazing. Is it Alex Rouse? Um, Jeffrey Rouse, think. San Antonio, Texas. I think Texas. it's Jeff. He's a prosthodontist, I think, in Texas, or he was in Texas. But but I liked um, I liked what you uh, what you said in the fact that um, um, that if you become a neuromuscular dentist, you're going to have to spend twenty five thousand dollars on equipment. Is that what you said? Mm. Yeah, it's just more expensive. Okay. Is that but, basically I mean, the tech I'm scan? Gonna, I'm not going to diss all the – if you do neuromuscular dentistry, just do it really well, okay? Um, the one thing that I got out of – I went to LVI, right, and I I learned a lot of techniques that I still use. I'm very grateful for what I learned there. I don't use neuromuscular, but I, I do use still some of the temporary techniques and the techniques for doing preps and stuff like that, okay? A lot of those basic practical techniques I use still every day. Uh, the one thing I don't use is the belief that you can take a good impression without using retraction cord. That I have learned to my cost. It actually takes longer to take the impression seven times because you keep missing a couple of margins than it does to just stuff retraction cord in all the teeth and take a decent impression first go. What about using a, using a uh, what about using a diode laser around the? I'm a dinosaur, but I just I use stuff that's I don't know some of the stuff I do. I went to dental school and learned all these things, and I tried all sorts of new techniques, and I sort of migrated back to. Sorry about that, not very techno. Some and, of my friends use lasers to great effect. In fact, one of my um, there's a friend of mine in Italy who is an absolute genius, and I like him because he's actually a real general dentist who earns all of his income from general dentistry, not from teaching. His name is Pasquale Venuti. That's with a Q, not a C, Pasquale Venuti. And he uses the laser all the time because he likes to barbecue the tissue like nobody's business. Okay, he, he, never, he never saw a bit of gum that was in the way of his wedge that he liked. He likes to get that gum gone. But the point I was making about, you know, what you said about, you know, the different occlusion camps is that, you know, neuromuscular is more expensive occlusion to learn. And then when you're talking about an implant system, um, I've always thought, you know, you can always find an implantologist, periodontist, oral surgeon somewhere within an hours of your office drive that will let you be their buddy and teach you everything they know. Yeah. Yeah, look, I would, okay, if, I don't know if you're, you have any deals with any implant companies, but... I don't have any I deals say, with anybody. Okay, I would say don't use expensive implants, okay? Um, Strauman is down here. They're still trying to flog implants at six or seven or eight hundred bucks each. That's just ridiculous, you know. The, so there you go. That's my tip. Don't use an implant that is incredibly expensive. Okay, implant milling is a very cheap thing to do. In fact, that's why implant companies are always trying to come out with innovative prosthetic attachments or specialist implants because their margins on regular implants are abysmal. There you go. And choose one with a good drill kit. Good drill kits are really nice. Okay, well, they're, just, they're, um, they're all going to ask you what system do you use. That's and the reason. Okay, I'll tell you what system reason, I have I use, and I'll tell you my thoughts on some of them. First of all, implants are screws. 
I reckon I could use just about anything as long as it wasn't manufactured in a dodgy manner. I don't like really rough surfaces, the ones that give you quick integration times, because they also give you quick deintegration times when things go wrong. And when you get complications, which you will, when you get pus around your implant, you don't want an implant that's rough. Okay. Uh, implants types that I have restored or done surgery with include Straumann 3i, Nobel, Southern, Biohorizons, MIS, and Trinon. So I have done prosthetics on all of them, and I've done surgery using uh, Nobel, Southern, Trinon, and MIS. Uh, MIS was the design that the Nobel Active comes from, if anyone's not familiar with what it looks like. Uh, I don't like implants with uh, rough surfaces, because when they fail, they fail really quickly. Although maybe that's a plus, I haven't decided yet. Uh, MIS and of the implant companies that I've used, the ones with the nicest drill kits by far have been MIS and BioHorizons. Their drill kit, now I haven't used any others, I've used those companies, but their drill kits are amazing. I mean, they have a thing that says, number one, use this drill here, and then there's a big arrow that says, now use this one next. And if you're not an experienced user or if you're using a kit for the first time with a new implant, like even if you're experienced, if you haven't used a drill kit before, that makes a huge difference to the total stress level of your surgery. So uh, I love the drill kits in those two companies. I have kind of moved away from pure conical connections. Pure conical connections are absolutely beautiful from a seal point of view. They are a nightmare if you want to do anything that's not single unit. Because then you've got to buy multi-units to go on top of all your implants. And then you're broke because you just spent huge money. So from a milling point of view, the people at the implant companies tell me that to mill a multi-unit, is considerably more difficult and time consuming than to mill an implant. That's why multi-units cost so much. To actually mill them takes the milling center at the implant company two to three times longer than to mill an implant. They're very complex. So I've kind of moved to the standard old internal hex for a lot of my cases because I just want to keep it simple and try and keep costs down. Okay, that's not scientific. That's just my personal thing. If you want to do something different, go right ahead. I want to ask you about another uh, another uh, um, kind okay, of. This will have to be the last one because patients here, I think. Oh come on! You're not going to sit there and put a patient first, are you? No. La la last question. Um, Australia is home of SDI, which is one of the biggest uh, dental uh, companies in the world, and they make glass onomers composite. It's also one of the largest amalgam manufacturers in the world. Is amalgam dead in Australia? Do you do you do you think? I mean, it's a low cost restoration. Uh, you're next to uh, you're down there in Asia, where you know you're you're next to poorer countries, China, Indonesia, mm. Africa. Do do you think amalgam has a place moving forward? Do you think 25 years from now SDI will still be one of the largest amalgam manufacturers in the world, or is that product just dead on arrival? People like white teeth. I think, that, and that's the end of that, isn't it? People like white teeth. I mean, you do get some patients who don't care. I get patients who have gold, okay? But I reckon if you're gonna bet on the shares of a company, a dental gold company is probably not one I'd put money into. So, you know, that's why all the companies that make gold for dentistry also make ceramics and stuff because they they got their foot in both, you know, they know where the market's going. People, the cases I see online from, you know, poorer countries, I don't see very many amalgam cases get done. Actually, most commonly, the cases I see in Melbourne get done are the really, really good dentists who use it in cases they just know they can't do any other way. Uh, I I no longer try and battle the public. If the public wants all the, you know, some people spend their entire life trying to tell all the patients they need to have fluoride and stuff like that. I, you know, I I don't care if people want to all do something that's a bit silly, that's their business. We all do silly things, so I, I don't really get into public health debates about what's good and what's not. I haven't used amalgam for years, um, not because I've got anything against it, it's a great material, I just, the, the number of patients I have that want it is, is about one a year, and doing a procedure once a year is not, you know, you're not good at things, you only do that that often. You know, that's a personal advice for me because at 53, I don't know if I'm getting old and tired, but 
the anti-fluoridationists, they just seem to get crazier and crazier and crazier. Oh, who cares? You know, give them what they want. I you know. know. Suck it up. I know. I think we should take out the fluoride, put uh, Coca-Cola in the water. That'd make them the most happy. Yeah, yeah something like that. Okay, well, hey, seriously, seriously, thank you for uh, 13,000 posts. Thanks for being my idol. Thanks for being everyone's role model. Uh, thank you so much for uh, canceling your 8 o'clock patient to spend it with me. No worries, and thank you for basically starting off the dentist sharing stuff on the internet, which I will say that I have learned more from. So I've learned more dentistry from the internet than all the courses put together.